Hello and welcome to a revision session on 17th century Britain. Today we'll be revising the basic timeline of rulership of the 17th century. We'll start by looking at the reign of Charles I, then the Republican government, the restoration of Charles II and the Glorious Revolution. The reign of Charles I began in 1625 after his father James I died. Notable dates in his reign include 1625 when he was crowned the king, 1629, when his personal rule began, 1640, the long parliament was formed, 1642, civil war began, 1648, his arrest, and 1649, when he was put on trial and beheaded for disloyalty, treason against his country. Charles I was crowned king in 1625. Initially, he was very popular, as was his uh, sidekick, the Duke of Buckingham. However, very early on in his reign, he started to fall out with members of Parliament, um, especially over the issue of finance. Uh, he wasn't given things like tonnage and poundage, which all other kings previously had been granted, and that caused him issues when he was trying to go to war with um, Cadiz and also La Rochelle in France. Um, so by 1629, the king, Charles I, had turned to personal rule. This was a period of time when, for about 11 years, Charles I did not call Parliament. Instead, he relied on his prerogative rights um, and called in taxes and adjusted taxes that already existed, such as ship tax. Uh, the period of personal rule was incredibly unpopular for the members of Parliament, and Charles I hit a problem when, uh, in 1639, uh, the first bishop's war broke out when he was attempting to enforce the English prayer book in Scottish churches. It cost Riots broke out in places such as Edinburgh and the king knew that he couldn't really win the war. He ended up having to sign the Treaty of Berwick in 1639 uh, because he wasn't able to raise enough funds to buy uh, mercenaries to fight an army and he wasn't able to get enough support from local uh, militia in England to successfully fight the war. This uh, then led to Charles calling, just before the Long Parliament, the Short Parliament, which was only lasting about three weeks. The aim of it was to try and get some more money, to borrow money and funds, so that he could um, in get together a, a larger army to go back and fight Scotland and still enforce that English prayer book. Um, however, However, Parliament were not happy to do this, and there was a taxpayers' strike, 1639-1640, to 1640, uh, trying to petition against having more funds being given to Charles I to go and fight a war with Scotland. This led Charles to dissolve Parliament after just three weeks, and he went to fight the Second Bishop's War in 1640, um, with a smaller number of troops um, than he really required. And also the troops that he did go with uh, weren't entirely loyal. Some of them actually sympathised with the Scots um, and it ended up with another defeat of Charles I by the Scots at the Battle of Newburn in Newcastle. And Charles I, in October 1640, was having to pay around £850 a day to the Scottish in, until they managed to reach an agreement called the Treaty of Ripon uh, where peace was arranged. Charles was effectively almost bankrupt at this point, and he had to call the Long Parliament. He had to call Parliament back. This Parliament became known as the Long Parliament because they were around for a number of years, in fact, all the way through uh, the First and Second Civil Wars. The build up between the formation of Long Parliament to the First Civil War uh, included a number of mistakes by Charles I. One key mistake was made in 1641 when an Irish rebellion of Catholics who were starting to attack Protestants in Ireland occurred. Now rather than returning to England to help deal with this Catholic threat, Charles remained in Scotland. This led, in 1641, Parliament to form its own army and this was the first time they'd ever done that. Previously only the King formed an army and the reason they formed this army was to fight the Catholic rebellion. However, it also meant that later on they had the resources to form their own army which would fight against Charles I, so it's a key turning point. However, Charles I was not the only one to cause issues which led up to the tensions causing the First Civil War to break out in 1642. Uh, a key group who caused massive tensions were Pym's Junto in Parliament, which included key MPs such as John Pym, but also others as well. 
um, and they were pressurising the king into making constitutional changes by passing things such as the Triennial Act, which forced the king to call Parliament at least once every three years, and also the Ten Propositions, which asked for more constitutional change. Additionally, uh, Parliament started impeachment proceedings against some of the King's um, priv uh, privy councillors, such as uh, the Earl of Strafford, and um, they forced him to sign the Act of Attainder, which would lead to the Earl of Strafford's death as well, uh, for treason theoretically, um, based on the idea that he had been involved in a Catholic plot against the King. Um, and an, an angry mob surrounded Parliament and sort of got to the point where Charles had to sign the treaty, the Act of Attainder, against the Earl of Strafford um, in order to prevent there being further rioting. Uh, a major event which caused the outbreak of the First Civil War was a rumour going round that of the impeachment of the Queen. Now, given that Parliament had already impeached both the Earl of Strafford and also impeached the Duke of Buckingham, or at least attempted to, um, it didn't seem entirely um, implausible that they might have been impeaching the Queen, potentially for her Catholic beliefs and her practices. So Charles I sent a number of men to Parliament to arrest and impeach or start impeachment proceedings against five members of Parliament, including John Pym, um, who he believed were doing the impeaching against the Queen. Um, the army sent there to arrest the five members of Parliament were too late as the rumours had spread and the five members of Parliament had escaped. The King panicked and he fled from London to Hampton Court. Um, at this point, the First Civil War uh, breaks out, uh, Parliament calling their own army and the King calling his own army. At this point in Nottingham, he'd gone as far as Nottingham up north. Um, and in August 1642, the First Civil War was declared by the King against Parliament. The two groups, uh, as we know, the key terms we use for them are the Cavaliers or the Royalists, who are the people supporting the King, and the Roundheads, also known as Parliamentarians, the people supporting Parliament in this civil war. The First Civil War lasted from 1642 to 1646. Initially, the Royalists were ahead, gaining advantages at the Battle of Edge Hill. However, uh, the Parliamentarians gained an advantage after the Battle of Marston Moor in 1644. There was an attempt at peace treaty talks in 1645, believe it or not, in Uxbridge. However, this didn't work out, and um, the New Model Army was formed by Fairfax and Cromwell, um, and uh, this consisted of about 22,000 men, and it was more united than forces previously had been, which meant Parliament became a much stronger force. Um, and eventually, um, in the Battle of Naseby, uh, they made a third major victory, and uh, by 1646, Charles had surrendered. After Charles I was captured in 1646 in April, there were attempts at reaching reconciliation between the King and Parliament. Uh, for example, the propositions, uh, the Newcastle propositions, made a number of different demands of the King, including the idea that perhaps peace would be arranged and the king would be returned to power if he made some constitutional changes, um, such as the fact that the, the parliament would be in control of the army for around 20 years and could choose who the key privy councillors and officers of state would be and that kind of thing. However, Charles didn't actually ever really answer. He delayed answering this uh, agreement. And whilst they were waiting for the king's reply, which was probably inevitably never going to be yes to that proposal, um, members of the New Model Army published their own declaration of what they wanted, um, and they published the representation of the army, which made uh, demands such as the triennial act would be replaced with a biennial one, so parliaments would be called every two years, um, and that parliament would be allowed to um, nominate key officers and control the army, and bishops would be... Uh, using the church, but they wouldn't have the same sort of powers as they did before because members of the New Model Army included the levellers and they wanted radical religious changes. And in fact, the levellers published their own proposals as to what they wanted to happen um, in settling with the king, which was called the case of the army truly stated. 
Charles briefly escaped from Hampton Court and then was recaptured again and secretly um, had made an agreement with the Scots that if they were to fight and help him to uh, regain control of the country that he would make some religious concessions for them. And this led to the outbreak of the Second Civil War in 1648 to 1649. The war was fairly brief. The Scottish troops were easily defeated by Cromwell's new model army. Cromwell started to accuse the king of treason, saying that uh, by renewing civil war again, uh, it was disloyalty to the point of treason against his own country. Some of Parliament, in fact a, a quite a large majority of Parliament, were still willing to negotiate with the king. The king claimed that uh, he would maybe consider some modified version of the Newcastle proposition that had previously been offered to him uh, as a settlement. However, a smaller group within Parliament um, started to argue the case for actually executing or punishing the king for what he'd done on the basis that it was treason. Now, in order to uh, pursue this, after the Second Civil War, um, there was the creation in 1648 of Rump Parliament. Its creation, or the event of its creation, is known as Pride's Purge, and it occurred in December 1648, when the army surrounded Parliament and either arrested or forcibly removed members of Parliament who still wanted to negotiate with the king and left behind those who wanted to punish the king. This eventually led to the trial and execution uh, of Charles I by Rump Parliament um, and therefore the end of the reign of Charles I. After the execution of Charles I, there was a question of who should take over. Now, since the Rump Parliament had been formed during Pride's Purge in the 1640s, the rule of the Rump continued, partly because originally they'd planned to have re-elections of a new parliament immediately after the execution of Charles I to decide who was uh, to rule. However, it was a very unstable environment, so the Rump Parliament began to rule. The original plan hadn't actually been for the Rump to rule in 1649 after the execution of the King, but in fact for there to be an election. However, the country was very unstable at the time and it was deemed impossible to have um, this election at this point. So the Rump Parliament was named as the sole legislative authority in England. That means the only group who were able to make laws. And they created for themselves something similar to what the, the King had had in the form of the Privy Council. Instead, they had the Council of State. Um, a group of people who would uh, make all the kind of decision-making and suggestions. The Rump Parliament ruled from around 1649 to 1653, and it only lasted for about four years for a number of reasons, but namely including the fact that they were seen as the creation of the army, given that Pride's Purge had created the Rump Parliament, and they didn't seem to really be fulfilling the desires of the armed arm, of the armed forces. So, for example, although they initially started out um, making lots of new laws and legislation, passing over a hundred laws in their first year, by 1652, three years later, they only passed around 50 laws, and it was seen as kind of slowly um, stopping the kind of legislative changes that were desired and, and people felt that they were slowing up and not really fulfilling the purpose that they had been created. So by 1654 a new form of parliament was created. Cromwell asked churches to elect members to a nominated assembly. Nominated because that means uh, kind of putting forward someone. So uh, they were ruling the country uh, from 1653 to 1654. And the idea was that they'd been selected by God or called by God to reform England. They were also known as the Barebones Parliament, which came from one of its radical members, Nicholas Barebone or Barbon. Although the nominated assembly, also known as the Barebones Parliament, did manage to create some reforms, it didn't really work long term because uh, some of the kind of more conservative gentry. Uh, landed members of the nominated assembly didn't really get on or agree with those who were more um, radical in the religious groups. 
and so it led to the closure of the bare bones parliament or the nominated assembly by 1654. In December 1653, the more moderate members of the nominated assembly uh, voted for its closure. After the closure of the nominated assembly, it was decided that a new type of government would be trialled out since the assembly hadn't really worked out and people hadn't been able to really agree with each other about what the changes should be. They decided instead of an assembly, they should have one single person in charge of government. And that led to the first protectorate where Oliver Cromwell was put in charge of government. Cromwell was named the Lord Protector of England and it was decided that on his death, a new protector would be elected by the Council of State. However, the first protectorate was not uh, very successful either, largely because it was the creation of the army again. Um, the instrument of government, the document which has suggested that Oliver Cromwell and a single person should be in charge in this first protectorate, had been written by uh, Lambert and major generals in, in the army. Um, and it was unpopular with other MPs who were part of the uh, Council of State and the who were MPs in the Parliament. And uh, these MPs, the Republicans, were fairly um, unhappy with the way that the First Protector was run, and they destabilised the government, and eventually that led to Cromwell seeing that things weren't working out and dissolving the First Protectorate in 1655. Cromwell in 1655 was faced with the problematic situation where there was a royal, royalist rebellion. And although it was an unsuccessful one, he realised that he needed greater control over the country and he introduced another form of government, uh, a military um, rule over the country called the Rule of the Major Generals, which is sometimes also known as the Second Protective, uh, Protectorate Parliament. To ensure that England was stable and there was no military rebellion, Oliver Cromwell suggested that major generals were put in charge of each major part of England. Um, this was successful, more successful in some areas of England than others, dependent on how effective each major general was at um, ruling that area. The major generals were known, in particular, they had a reputation for suppressing traditional entertainment, and that was incredibly unpopular. And uh, although in some ways there was an element of stability in the country and by 1657 Oliver Cromwell had even been offered the crown of uh, England and perhaps to become the king, um, he rejected this and um, he realised that the unpopular nature of the Major General's rule meant that there was a need for a new constitution. So by 1657 there was a new constitution. The Second Protectorate Parliament suggested the humble petition and advice in 1657. And this uh, firstly suggested that there should be government by a king to ensure stability and that there would be hereditary succession so their son or daughter would take over the ruling of the country after they died. But Oliver Cromwell refused this part of the humble petition and advice um, and so they changed the idea to it being um, a Lord Protector in charge of the country instead, but still hereditary succession um, and that the Parliament would be able to control the army so that there wouldn't be as much uh, concern as there had been when the Major Generals had been in charge. There'd also be regular elections and some religious toleration as well. Cromwell died in 1658 and by 1659 a third protectorate was established. Uh, this had uh, his son, Richard, in charge. Uh, this was because part of the humble petition of advice had of course been the idea of hereditary succession so his son would automatically take over. This third protectorate was incredibly brief, largely because the army had been involved in the creation of all the protectorates and they didn't like the fact that Richard uh, didn't have any real military experience and they saw him as an unacceptable ruler of the country. One general who had actually supported the king, the royalist side of the civil war, um, earlier on in the First and Second Civil Wars, George Monk, um, therefore marched down from Scotland to England um, to forcibly remove Richard from power uh, as he didn't see that he would be a very effective leader for the country. So by 1660, 
an alternative to the third protector it was being looked for. General Monk and other members of the army suggested in 1660 that Charles II, Charles I's son, who had uh, run away to exile in Holland after his father had been executed to hide and protect himself, should be welcomed back to England, potentially as the new leader of the country. The early provisions for this were set out in the Declaration of Breda, but um, it actually took around four years for a, a settlement to be reached with Charles II upon his return. Um, this period of uh, reaching a restoration settlement lasted from 1660 to 1664. The Declaration of Breda, which was devised in collaboration between um, General Monk and Charles II himself, made a number of different promises about religious toleration and uh, the fact that the king would work in partnership with Parliament as opposed to personally ruling like Charles I had done. However, the transition to having a king again wasn't a smooth one. Parliament was still unsure about giving... Charles II financial freedom and offered him therefore less money than he actually required so he would need to consult Parliament regularly in order to raise taxation um, to ensure he had the funds he needed. Um, so this led to early tension between the King and Parliament. Charles II also claimed uh, the power of divine right to rule. He claimed that he had been in the twelfth year of his reign when he took over in 1660 um, as monarch. So that suggested that he had automatically become the king at the point when his father was killed uh, and therefore just continued reigning uh, throughout that time period. So effectively ignoring the fact that Republican governments had ruled England in the in-between period. Um, and by doing this, he was undermining the power of the Parliament and suggesting that he still had those prerogative powers that his father had used. Charles II also caused tensions uh, in the period of his rule since uh, he supported the French cause uh, and the French were Catholic. Uh, it was unsurprising given his mother, Henrietta Maria, was a French Catholic, but it raised suspicions about him himself being a Catholic and that caused tension in the country. A Church of England priest called Titus Oates spread rumours of popish plots and plots of Catholics against the Protestants and against uh, the king himself um, and started to uh, try those who he believed were to blame. And tensions re reached a real uh, height around 1681 during the exclusion crisis. Um, the government became worried that since Charles II and his wife didn't have any children, um, that his brother, Charles II's brother, James, would take over when Charles died. And James was a Catholic. So they attempted to pass uh, an act called the Exclusion Bill in 1679, uh, preventing his brother from becoming the king should Charles I die without children. And that absolutely caused massive tensions between the two groups because Charles was horrified and saw Parliament as completely overstepping their right because he believed in the divine right. So therefore, if he, if he died and his brother took over, then he had the right to become the king. Um, and in 1660, Parliament again attempted to do the same thing. Uh, again, the, the king blocks their attempts to pass the uh, laws long enough for some of the kind of anti-Catholic hysteria to um, subside and become less powerful than it had been. Um, but Charles also made a secret agreement at this time with uh, the French king, Louis XIV, um, that he would support France if any hostility was shown towards them and he would suspend Parliament if any hostility was shown towards them uh, for being Catholic. In 1685, Charles II died and... Since Charles II had been successful in suppressing the exclusion crisis, um, Charles II's brother, James II, took over a Catholic in charge of England in 1685. James II was incredibly unpopular for a number of reasons, but largely because he used his prerogative rights to rule and attempt to rule um, on his own a form of personal rule, um, and also because of his Catholic tendencies. So, for example, uh, the case of Godden and Hales, 
proved that he was a strong Catholic believer and someone who was going to support the Catholics in 1686 um, when um, it was a case in court. Sir Edward Hales, who was a Catholic, being persecuted by a man called Arthur, God Arthur Godden um, and Arthur Godden accused Edward Hales of um, trying to become a military commander without being Church of England and being Catholic instead. And the king um, supported Edward Hales and said that um, he could judge whether or not Hales was at fault and said that Hales was not at fault for being Catholic. Uh, so kind of proving that he was supporting Catholics um, and not prosecuting them. And that made people very worried about his religion. This caused further problems because in 1687 he granted freedom of worship to Catholics as well as Protestants um, in the Declaration of Indulgence and this caused major tensions. It's unlikely that he, James II, really wanted to pursue making everyone a Catholic but people at the time were very concerned about what was going on because of things going on in the continent in France where the Louis, the six, uh, Louis the XIV had um, started to persecute Protestants. So people in England became worried that, well, if James II is like Louis and he's also Catholic, what if James II in England starts to persecute Protestants here too? So even though he didn't, uh, what was going on in France caused these extra tensions. Not only this, but by 1688... James II's wife gave birth to a baby boy who would be brought up as a Catholic, which meant that people's fears were confirmed. The next Catholic, the next monarch would also be a Catholic, and therefore so on and so forth, um, there would be a succession of Catholic monarchs. And that went completely against the desires of the majority of the country. In 1688, this therefore led to the events called the Glorious Revolution, a letter was sent to William of Orange in Holland asking him to come to England with armed forces to um, support Parliament and their cause. The seven political figures who had sent the letter actually represented a really broad spectrum of different people um, and it showed how um, varied it was that it went from people who had been Catholic and converted to being Church of England, uh, as well as um, people who were earls and re previously been impeached. Um, and it showed how many people James II had alienated during his reign. If James II had called his forces and defended himself, it's likely that he may actually have succeeded in uh, beating William of Orange's forces. However, he didn't do this. And when William uh, landed in Devon and approached London in December 1688, uh, it was James II that panicked and ran away, um, therefore leaving the country effectively without a leader. So William of Orange and his wife Mary were declared the uh, new heirs to the throne and were crowned king and queen, Protestants of England in 1688. Um, and that was the Glorious Revolution. So that, in brief, was the revision of the 17th century uh, British timeline of events of who was in charge of England. Uh, you will definitely want to do some extra reading on these topics before you sit your exam. For extra reading, use your textbook Bullock, Nuttall and White's Revolutions in Early Modern and Modern Europe, pages 13 to 38. Good luck with your revision!